Good morning. This is a short presentation for M1, 2 and 3 for Unit 21, uh, Aspects of Contract and Business Law. Uh, the aim of the session is to go through all the relevant information that you need to help you with this particular assignment. Uh, there will be various challenges such as going on to West Law to find uh, facts of cases and then applying those facts to the actual scenario given. Uh, you already have the actual scenario, so I'm not going to read through that, but I'm going to take you through the actual body and content of the uh, assignment question. Uh, the first thing to think about in any essay, as uh, I've already mentioned before, is to think about the essay. And because this is mainly based on a contractual relationship and remedies and consumer rights, the best place normally to start is to define what a contract is in your own words. You would have come across this when you did any employment law assignment and also the initial stages of the uh, first pass task for Unit 21 aspects of contract law and business. So define what a contract is in your own words and then go on to mention very briefly uh, the elements of uh, a valid contract. So you're looking at offer and acceptance, consideration, intention, capacity and form. I think the first four will be the most important. Uh, the next thing you need to do, and this is where your independent research comes into play, because the whole idea is that it's a merit task and we're looking for students who can demonstrate that extra ability to individualise their answers. So you have to do most of the work yourself. Um, so the first case you need to look at is the case called Storer and Manchester City Council. And Lord Denning, in that case, who was the Master of the Rolls at the time, spoke uh, about consensus ad idem. And all that means is that if there is ever going to be a contract, the courts have to be satisfied that both parties wanted to form that relationship. In other words, consensus ad idem simply means a meeting of minds. And if there is a meeting of minds, that would normally be evidenced in one person making an offer and the other person accepting that offer and all the other elements coming into play. So don't forget in your introduction, find the case of Storer and Manchester City Council in 1974 and talk about a meeting of minds being good evidence that both parties or the parties involved wanted to form a contractual relationship. And the next point is to do with the actual body of your answer. And the case involves Mrs Rooney uh, wanting to have a bathroom fitted and therefore she uh, co contracts with a leaky bathroom. Uh, as part of the body, you would have to demonstrate whether there was actually a contract between Mrs Rooney and Leaky Bathrooms. And if there is a contract, then it goes without saying that you have to identify all the elements involved in that contract. Uh, once the contract is established, then as we've mentioned in previous lectures, then both parties to the contract have rights and obligations. Both parties promise each other to do certain things. In this particular instance, Mrs Rooney would promise to pay for the services of uh, leaky bathrooms, and leaky bathrooms in turn would promise to carry out the work to a satisfactory standard. Um, in this relationship, you're always looking for an offer, and as you read through the actual scenario, you've got to clearly identify if one party made a clear offer. Once you've identified that one person has made a clear offer, the next thing is to identify whether that offer was accepted. accepted. And it's quite easy to work that out once you read carefully through the scenario. Because there is, and I'll go straight on to the next slide, there is a mention of a leaflet giving information about 15% discount. So all we've got to do as law students or business students doing law is to work out the significance of the information in the leaflet. Uh, Mrs Rooney would want to hope that she should be entitled to 15%, uh, but we can only work that out if we can determine the legal significance of the leaflet. So is the leaflet uh, an offer? or an invitation to treat. Um, you would have to look at two different cases with contrasting legal principles to work that out. 
In the case of Carlin and the carbonic smoke bomb in 1893, it was clearly identified that, generally speaking, advertisement can sometimes be offers, especially if they're offers for a reward. In the opposite case of Partridge and Crittenden, uh, advertisements were classed as invitations to treat. So you have to work out whether the information in the leaflet fits neatly into either Carlyle or Partridge and Crittenden. The most important point to make after that is let's assume that you think that the leaflet is an invitation to treat. That means that Leaky Bathroom are inviting Mrs Rooney to make the offer. Once Mrs Rooney makes the offer, Leaky Bathroom are then in a position to accept or reject the offer. Uh, there is a case to support um, advertisements or information regarding what one person might intend to do. And the case of Harrison Nickerson in 1873 is uh, a good case to use to work out whether the information in the leaflet is actually an offer or an invitation to treat. It will certainly go in Mrs Rooney's favour if the information about giving anybody who purchases a bathroom 50% is classed as an offer. Because when Mrs Rooney responds to that offer, she's actually accepting that offer, which means that she makes a contract based on the 15% discount. It also means that Leaky Bathroom must give her that particular discount. Um, so, uh, once you've looked at all those cases, Harrison, Nixon, Partridge and Crittenden, and Carlo and the Carbolic Smoke Ball, what you need to do next is to confirm the existence of a contract. And, and I think as you read through the case uh, or, or the scenario, there's clear evidence that they did at some point come to an agreement. So you, I suppose, are at liberty to work out whether Mrs Rooney made the offer and it was accepted or vice versa. Uh, it's not too important. The key thing here is we know that after reading through uh, half of the information in the assignment, we know that they came to an agreement. So there is a contract. And once there is a contract, then we have rights and obligations arising based on that particular contract. Right, so um, as we read through the scenario, it mentions that leaky uh, bathroom after the contract had formed didn't turn up as promised. This has legal significance uh, either against leaky bathroom or for the benefit of Mrs. Rooney, depending on how you look at that particular point. So uh, in relation to the date, and it doesn't mention what that date was, but in relation to the date, the fact that they didn't turn up on the date scheduled, would the courts consider that uh, an important term, which would be a condition or simply a warranty? If it's a condition and leaky bathroom didn't turn up, that simply means that Mrs. Rooney can cancel the whole contract. However, if the courts decide that it was simply a warranty, then Mrs. Rooney is unable to cancel the contract. She will probably be entitled to some form of compensation. Uh, we looked at uh, the case of Bettini and Guy for matters related to conditions and the case of Poussard and Spires and Pond in 18, 1876. I beg your pardon, that should read 1876 and not 1976. So do please make that correction. Right, so what we need to do is have a look at Mrs. Rooney's uh, consumer rights. Uh, the key thing that we notice is that when the bathroom was eventually delivered, it wasn't as described. So you need to talk about the implications of section 13. Is the promise made by the seller in section 13 a condition? Is it an important part of the contract? So if you ask for a red shirt that you've not physically examined, it arrives and it's a green shirt. What rights do you have under section 13? So speak about Mrs Rooney's rights in relation to section 13. And then have a look at the case of Beale and Taylor in 1967, and that case relates to section 13. Then move on to the next point, apart from the goods not matching the description, in other words the bathroom suite wasn't as expected by uh, Mrs Rooney, it also started leaking. So section 14.2 simply requires that anything sold to a consumer has to be of satisfactory quality. Again, have a look at the actual provision under section 14.2 because it states what aspects can be classed as falling under satisfactory quality. 
There's also a case of priest and lust, um, and then uh, please have a look at that case and identify the significance. Um, and again, I believe I'll have to check the year on that. I believe it's 18, uh, 1908. Right, if we move on to the case of Mrs. Rooney, uh, again, um, any item which generally isn't of satisfactory quality also means that it probably isn't fit for purpose either. So you've got an interesting case to do with underwear in the case of Grant and Australia Knitting Mills in 1936. So again, talk about the remedies available for Mrs. Rooney. It goes without saying that Mrs. Rooney's husband, who was injured, uh, should be able to claim some form of compensation. But the key point to mention there is that because the contract wasn't directly made with Mrs. Rooney's husband, then you would talk about uh, Mrs. Rooney claiming on behalf of her husband. Uh, the final point in the assignment is to talk about remedies. Last week we spoke about remoteness of damages, and that simply means that the courts are not always willing to give a limitless amount of compensation. Uh, any compensation you claim must not be too remote from the actual contract formed. Uh, the case of Hadley and Baxendale is a good case to explain what we mean by remoteness of damages. Apply that to Mrs. Rooney's case, and it seemed very likely that based on the principles of remoteness of damages, her claim is not too far removed from the actual contract that she formed. She should expect to get a bathroom suite, as she described, and she should ex uh, expect to get a bathroom suite which is uh, of satisfactory quality and fit for purpose. Neither of these were, uh, happened, and therefore she's very likely to be entitled to compensation. Um, compensation is simply putting Mrs Rooney back into the position she would have been in had the contract been performed properly. So um, I think you should clearly explain in your answer that Mrs Rooney should be entitled to compensation and then just state the purpose of compensation. So whatever she paid for the bathroom suite, she should either get the money back or she should uh, get a replacement bathroom suite. Uh, mitigation of loss, uh, we mentioned that as well, and the point about mitigation of loss is simply that Mrs Rooney must attempt to lessen the effects of the breach of contract. In practice, all that means is that Mrs Rooney should employ another uh, bathroom company to install the bathroom, bathroom suite, and then she can sue leaky bathroom. Once you've done that, just draw your essay to a conclusion, and hopefully, so long as you followed the notes in the presentation, and these notes will be on Moodle, you shouldn't go too far wrong from answering uh, M1, 2, and 3. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this video presentation on M1, 2, and 3, Unit 21, uh, Aspects of Conduct and Business Law. Thank you.